On the corner of La Cienega and Santa Monica Boulevard, you will find an architecturally significant drugstore. But for a few hot years once upon a time, between 1979 and 1981, it was a roller skating paradise called Flipper's Roller Boogie Palace. Painted bright purple and blue, it was the grooviest place for stars and stargazers to spin around referred to as LA's Studio 54 on Wheels. Roller skating was a huge fad, particularly in the gay world. It was great for the legs, it was great for the glutes. People went absolutely wild over it. One popular homo skater's look was wearing satin bomber jackets and very worn jeans cut off at the tippy top of the thighs. There were skaters on the beach, there were skaters on the streets, some hustlers would even skate up to parked cars to negotiate a date, particularly in West Hollywood. At Slippers, colorful lights would pulsate amongst fake palm trees in a tropical-themed atmosphere while pumping out disco. Or perhaps a live band would play as crowds skated around them. And not just any band. Groups like the Go-Go's, Berlin, the Ramones, Patti Smith, Talking Heads, and even Prince all purportedly appeared. Fans flocked, especially when gay icons like Jane Fonda, Cher, Olivia Newton-John all made Flippers their WeHo Xanadu, adding to its legendary status. When developers bulldozed Flippers, they also demolished a black gay landmark, the Jim Morris Gym located next door. Now a glorious parking ramp. Jim Morris was a handsome African-American bodybuilding champion. He privately trained celebrity clients before opening up one of the first gyms in this part of town. Morris even worked as Elton John's personal bodyguard from 1974 to 1988. Jim Morris Gym was famous for its pink neon sign that glowed with the word muscles. It was quite the busy place. And folks say Morris often personally took on interest in young aspiring bodybuilders as special projects. He was still training until his late 70s and believed that his vegan lifestyle contributed to his excellent condition. Jim Morris passed away at the age of 80. Up until the 1970s, guys with big deltoids were somewhat a rarity in the gay world. Many gay American men had grown up with the idea that athletics were for straight men only and had never developed their bodies. But in the 1970s, that changed big time. The cult of the body was becoming a big deal, and West Hollywood became sort of a ground zero for hot macho men in hot shirts and hot tight jeans seeking other hot macho men like themselves. It's hard to describe the electric feeling of being in the midst of such homoerotic possibility. And that hasn't changed entirely. But what it has changed is the sense that it's a daring new public adventure and genuinely idealistic. Back in the day, exploring one's gay sexuality felt like a righteous political and moral cause. There was the feeling of inventing something new and world-changing. To paraphrase Oscar Wilde, the love that dare not speak its name was finally never going to shut up. Now let us celebrate this one strip of Santa Monica Boulevard, known colloquially around the world as Boys Town. Apparently, the name Boys Town comes from an actual Catholic charity orphanage for underprivileged and delinquent youth run by friendly priests. Leave it to the gays to twist some sexual innuendo into something so spotlessly innocent as the Catholic Church. Right? Though West Hollywood is certainly bigger than this one street, the Boulevard carries the distinction of being one of the most publicly gay streets in Los Angeles. It has the highest concentration of gay bars in the whole city. It hosts an annual massive gay pride festival for over 30 years, and it hosts the wildly festive street carnival for Halloween. Actually, both of these events 
of interesting origins. Before moving to West Hollywood on Santa Monica Boulevard in 1979, the first Christopher Street West Gay Pride Parade was organized by Morris Kite, Troy Perry, and Bob Humphreys. It began at Hollywood Boulevard and McCadden Place on June 28, 1970, reflecting a time when the area had stronger gay associations. There were pride marches in New York City and Chicago that year, but Los Angeles has the distinction of holding the world's first ever officially permitted pride parade. But it wasn't easy to accomplish. The LAPD put up several hurdles against it happening, surprise, surprise, but fortunately the ACLU stepped in to help. Today, while some folks argue about the proliferation of near-naked men on parade floats, or the over-commercialization of pride, it's important to remember the hard-fought struggle the freedom to celebrate represents. As for Halloween, it used to be carefree and cruisy over all of Los Angeles. Public outdoor parties, private mass balls, and drag, and Dracula are common occurrences on that night. By the 1970s, Viho became informally established as the place to party and strut your costume creativity. The West Hollywood Halloween Carnival regularly attracts around half a million people each year. Sure, there are always complaints that it's become overrun by straight tourists and shopper bugs, who come merely to gawk at the cleverly costumed queens rather than celebrate the gay pagan right that some love. But, if you're going to get all dressed up, you need an audience, right? Or as I like to say, victims. Another note about the streets of WeHo. Yes, some places were notoriously wild pickup scenes. The alleys along Melrose Avenue were particularly crazed in the 80s. And prior to that, Robertson Boulevard was known for its outrageous shenanigans. Eventually, however, gay organizations partnered with the LAPD to put a stop to all that compulsive behavior. Many activists were incensed that community leaders seemed to take sides with literally the sex police. Some called it the price of acceptance, others called it an obscene obsession with respectability. And this is a division that continues to this day. Thanks for watching another episode of the Stuart Timmons LGBTQ History Tour. possibility. Mm -hmm.